Brian, thanks very much for that kind introduction. So I'm gonna talk about our project to uh, help predict the age of onset in inherited prion disease. So uh, to summarize this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about the inherited prion diseases and cover some of the other terms that are commonly used to describe um, groups of patients in uh, of this disorder. And um, the experience of inherited prion disease in a specialist clinic in the UK and compare that to what would be expected elsewhere in the world. I'm then going to focus on the age of onset of disease as a key variable and how unpredictable that is. It's important um, if we are to help people with this condition that we try and understand age of onset better uh, and what might determine the age of onset. And through those questions was conceived this project, the, the Inherited Prion Disease Modifier Project. I'm going to describe um, what we're trying to do uh, and how we're going to do an analysis and try and detect determinants of age of onset, and then an update on uh, where we are in the project right now. So the Inherited Prion Diseases are a really diverse group of um, neurodegenerative disorders. And there are a number of different terms used for groups of patients within um, the overall category. Um, the most, most common worldwide is, is familial CJD. And patients with this disorder present with a spectrum of problems with thinking skills, jerky movements, and balance problems. And the most common mutation that's found um, that causes the disorder is, is called E200K. And this refers to a position in the gene that encodes the prion protein, the prion protein gene. Perhaps the next most common um, is gerstmann straussler scheinker disease. And this refers to something quite different, uh, a progressive loss of balance associated with stiff, painful legs, often with loss of feeling in the legs. And only later in the disease does uh, the thinking skills become affected. And that's typically associated with a mutation at position 102. Um, familial fatal insomnia is also relatively frequent in the inherited prion diseases worldwide. This is associated with a progressive insomnia, but changes in blood pressure, pulse, temperature, sweating, and other elements of the autonomic nervous system are affected, along with movement problems and dementia. It's a relatively rapidly progressive condition. But, you know, those are the, traditionally the most common types, but also we're aware of octopeptide repeat insertions that seem to have quite a distinct phenotype that doesn't, doesn't fit with the others, often a very slow disorder of behavior and learned movements that might last over 10 or 15 years. And we've also described a particular type of mutation, one that truncates the protein um, associated with a non-neurological presentation, loss of feeling in the feet and drops in blood pressure on standing. So a really diverse set of different clinical disorders now, this is, this is a complicated slide, but what I want to get across here is that a lot of what determines the type of illness that might happen in the inherited prion diseases is the exact code for the mutation. And, and we know about an awful lot of different um, mutations or coding changes in the prion protein gene over the last 30 years. All of the inherited prion diseases are caused by mutation of the prion protein gene. Some we're very, very confident about and we understand relatively well. Others have perhaps found just only in a handful of individuals around the world, and we're still uncertain about exactly what risks they confirm. So a typical family tree looks a bit like this, with the uh, Roman numerals on the, on the left referring to different generations of a family, circles referring to females and squares, males, and then vertical lines connecting to uh, children. And typically in the inherited prion diseases, they're transmitted in families as what's called an autosomal dominant trait. And what does, it, what does that mean? It means the risk for each generation is 50% is of inheriting the mutation. And as you can see in this generation three, uh, this uh, woman in the previous generation, this mum had eight children by two different men, and, and four of those children did eventually develop the disease and die from it. Four were unaffected. And it's only those affected individuals that can pass on uh, the mutation to their children. Some of the pedigrees um, that I look after 
or help look after patients in uh, in the UK are very, very large, and, and there may be several hundred individuals at risk of inheriting a mutation in these pedigrees that here I just illustrate connected by people that died from the disease. So um, in the UK in the last 30 years, we've diagnosed 235 individuals uh, with a prion protein gene mutation and inherited prion disease and know that the age at which the disease started. That's across 21 different mutations, which fall into uh, four different groups. The, the large insertional mutations, E200K I talked about that causes familial CJD, and P102L that causes GSS or Gerstmann Strauss, typically. Um, globally, the situation is perhaps a little bit different in that um, the D178N mutation that can be associated with fatal familial insomnia is much more common in some of the countries than in the UK. And the octopeptide repeat insertions, the six OPRI mutation I refer to here is is perhaps less common in other countries than it is in the UK. But what I wanna focus on for the rest of the talk um, is the age of onset of, of these. And here I show a, uh, a column chart showing the ranges of ages at which those 235 patients presented with, with illness. It's highly, highly variable. And the, the average is in the mid fifties, but the range is extraordinarily from, from 26 up to, up to 90, which obviously makes a whole world of difference for the person that got the disease from the start of their adult life through to the, um, the very end of it. So about half of this variation appears to be explained by exactly which mutation is found, but half of it is unexplained. And even within the same family, there remains an awful lot of variation that's unexplained. So is the tendency within a family to have an early start of the disease or a late start of the disease over time in life that could make a whole world of difference? Is that, is that predictable in any way? And you know, what, what are the anecdotal experiences of this first? Well, anecdotally, I don't know of environment, obvious environmental triggers. And certainly taking clinical histories from these patients haven't, hasn't revealed that in everyday clinical practice. I also have seen marked variation in parent-child pairs, such that in some circumstances, the child may develop the disease before the parent uh, because the parent had a late onset type of disease and the child an early onset. But can we be a little more scientific and statistical about this? And, and there are two papers um, published that, that attempt to answer the question uh, of whether or not parents and children, and obviously they share that if they're both affected by the disease, they will share the same pre and protein gene mutation. But aside from that, do they, sh they share a tendency to have an early or a late onset type of disease? And actually the, the, the evidence from these, um, these looks is somewhat mixed, unfortunately. So it's a little inconclusive. So, so in work I did with a young doctor uh, about 13 years ago, we found some evidence that there appeared to be a correlation within families. But a later look with Eric Minikel and several other collaborators around the world, we, we didn't confirm that. Um, when we looked in, but, but there were important differences between these studies, and I think it's, it's still not completely clear what the truth is. So what about, so if we don't know for sure whether or not there might be determinants of age of onset in the inherited prion diseases, what about in similar diseases? And th there are some nice papers coming out in related disorders, so I'm not talking about prion disease now, other kinds of disorders like, say, breast cancer or or a familial tendency to having high cholesterol um, that have investigated links between common and rare disorders. So, so broadly, the risk of diseases fall into two categories. One is you know, a single mutation like what I've been describing in the inherited prion diseases that really determines, are you gonna get this disease or are you not gonna get this disease, whether you have it or you don't have it. But in addition, there are common genetic variants. And, and you know, there may be hundreds, if not thousands of these that determine your risk for for, for an illness or, or a, say, a, a trait like blood pressure or, or altered cholesterol. Now, individually, these genetic variants that explain differences between all of us in the population may have really minimal effects uh, on, on an individual disease risk. But collectively, if you can summarize them all together, they may amount to, to very significant risk. And there are statistical techniques that have now been developed to summarize the totality of one's natural genetic risk for a condition is something called a polygenetic risk score or PRS. 
Now, this paper that I'm, I'm showing on the left shows that um, in the Mendelian diseases, meaning the ones that are inherited with a gene mutation in families, are typically modified by the sum of all the small uh, risks conferred by common genetic variations. So there is an interplay between your genetic background and um, a, a mutation that's inherited within a family. Now, this isn't, this hasn't been shown for the inherited prion diseases, but it has been shown for several other uh, related, what's called Mendelian or familial disorders. So what about the polygenic risk score? Um, has such a thing been developed in CJD? Well, yes, recent, in recent years, um, uh, collaborators have joined together to make large collections of, of DNA from patients that died from sporadic CJD. And these have been analyzed with genetic techniques to derive a polygenic risk score for sporadic CJD. Actually, it's, an, it's not useful in predicting your risk of sporadic CJD in the population. And, and the main reason for that is because thankfully the condition is so rare. However, this polygenic, polygenic risk score may be useful in uh, modifying the risk of inherited prion disease or the age at which the disease starts. So that's where uh, the concept for this project came from. So we have a large case control study of sporadic CJD. So we have this information about the overall genetic risk for sporadic CJD. We can derive polygenic risk scores. If we then were able to acquire inherited prion disease samples associated with an age of onset, um, we could then run genome-wide arrays to determine uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, common genetic variation. We can fill in the missing genetic variation using computational techniques. And then we can test whether this polygenic risk score or, or, or um, individual candidate genetic variations can um, alter uh, the age at which the illness starts. Of course, we're gonna have to account for the particular mutation the sex um, of individuals, their genetic background, you know, their, their ancestry and the contributing side, but, but we have established techniques to account for those variables. So what about, it, it's not just inherited prion disease patients, we can use this also information that we can learn from people that carry uh, prion protein gene mutations, but thankfully haven't developed the disease until relatively old age. And I've, I'm suggesting a method here through which we might be able to use um, the, the apparently protective information, the, the protective genetic variables that these individuals might have to, to combine in a single analysis so we can look at both the determinants of an age of onset in uh, people that sadly developed um, the inherited prion disease and additionally look at those individuals that carry prion protein gene mutations, but, but survived into older ages without uh, any signs of the disease at all. So where are we at the moment? So we're in a phase um, of collecting samples from around the world. I'm really pleased to report that there was a pretty much universally po positive response to a request uh, to join forces uh, and do this research together. I've listed individuals that have um, already contributed or plan to contribute samples. We have 977 already. The target was achieving 1,000 samples. There are more that are due to arrive, so I'm confident we'll hit our target. And, and you know, I expect before the end of the year that we will conclude the sample collection um, uh, part of the project and go on to processing the genome-wide arrays. So we'll finish there. Um, and. Uh, say thanks. I'd very much like to thank all the contributing sites, the genetics team at, at the Institute of Prion Diseases, the clinical team, um, John Collins is the director of the institute where I work, and of course, most importantly, I'd like to thank the Jeffrey and Mary Smith Family Foundation and the Davy Nock Memorial Research Grant and um, Strides for CJD and of course the CJD Foundation. Um, thank you very much for your attention.